to still use explicit violence in your writings? It's what I do, is one answer. I write horror fiction. There is a kind of curiosity that we have as human beings about our life processes. One of our last life processes is death. It's a legitimate subject for curiosity. We shouldn't be ashamed that the macabre or the morbid exercises some fascination upon us. I tell it like it is. If it's there in my mind's eye, I put it on the page. And that seems to me to be a legitimate way to write. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the launch episode of the Written in Red podcast. That is the horror reader and writer's podcast. It is a podcast for both because uh, myself, Aaron Beauregard, uh, Splatterpunk nominated author and Carver Pike. What's going on, guys? This is Carver Pike, Splatterpunk award nominated author of uh, Slaughterbox. And I've written Grad Night, Scalp, a few other books under my hat. What's going on, guys? So myself, Carver Pike, uh, Daniel Volpe. Hey, everybody. Dan Volpe here, author of Billy Silver and Awakened in Blood. And Roland Bercy, Jr. Hey, everybody. Uh, Roland Bercy, um, author of Unbortion, uh, winner of the 2020 American Fiction Awards and the 20. 19 um, finalists in the International Book Awards, and also uh, Payback as a Witch, and one other. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so the four of us are coming together to sort of uh, bring a platform, what will hopefully become a platform for the horror community, um, as we try to promote maybe some lesser known books that you may not be aware of. Um, we will be doing any any kind of horror, really, but our focus should primarily be in the extreme horror uh, splatterpunk genre as that is our forte for the most part. Um, but we are an open door. If there's other, if there's other stuff, you know, if there's paranormal horror writers, you may get them on here too. Um, and it's going to be everything from taking a look at different books that maybe don't get the uh, appropriate spotlight um, to also the second half of the podcast where we're going to be giving a, uh, any sort of advice that we can and just discussing uh, writing horror in an open forum and everything that we've sort of learned and um, we'll also be addressing questions from listeners uh, be it readers or writers so you should really have a, a good opportunity to learn about some interesting stories that you might otherwise not and also if you're aspiring to write yourself or if you're just interested uh, in the process, you know, and, and how how it all gets done. How does the idea go from your head uh, into somebody's Kindle or a physical book on their bookshelf? Uh, so and we'll be doing everything right. I think um, since we've started talking about this project, we've all kind of learned a lot, too. Um, and, you know, I think um, it'll be everything from editing to cover art to concepts, uh, storyline, literally anything you can imagine. Um, so I want to thank you guys real quick for agreeing to do this project. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. The podcast will be on a bi-weekly basis um, so we can kind of make sure that we have uh, appropriate material prepared to deliver to you that's high quality. What do you think, guys? Sounds like a yeah. plan. Let's get it going. Yeah. I think it's just, you're just hanging out with your friendly indie extreme horror authors here. Just uh... a... <laughs> friendly neighborhood of horror authors so shooting yeah, the shit the being friends yeah there you go and uh be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you want to get the updates uh you can do so on itunes and spotify right now also the youtube channel will have videos uploaded for each episode that we do in case you want to see our pretty uh cocksuckers you know <laughs> <laughs> what is you... <laughs> oh man yeah oh. <laughs> You guys got nothing to say on that, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just watch a Roland's reaction. I just, yeah, I hate my, I think my ears, <laughs> But there, so yeah, so there you have it. Um, that's going to be the weekly show. But these first four episodes are going to be a little bit different, only because uh, we kind of want you guys to get to know us real quick. 
So these, these first four are going to consist of each of us presenting a book at the beginning of one episode that had a great impact on us um, in our horror writing or just inspired us in some way. And then in the second half, you'll sort of get a uh, interview where the three of us will sort of uh, question uh, one person. And today that's going to be Daniel Volpe. Uh, he'll be doing the first interview, which brings us into the first book of inspiration, which I'm going to which I'm going to be talking about. And that is Clive Barker's Books of Blood. And this is volumes one through three. So it's uh, this is the one I bought, actually. I know originally they were released in separate volumes. Um, but this was the one that I came across. And um, that sort of had a, a big change on me. Uh, any of you guys read Clive at all before I kind of talk about it a little? Yeah, I have. I've read quite a few of his his works. I've read just a couple of his stories. I've started on that one. I've actually got it back here on the shelf. That's what I was just looking at. So I need to pull it out and get back to it myself. Yeah, not me, not yet. Really? That's kind of surprising, yeah, Roland. I, I think I, I know you like like the sort of uh, demon like your paybacks a a witch book. In some ways, feels like uh, kind of in the same tone a little bit, but. Yeah, but yeah, well, I think... we talked a little bit, and and from what you told me about it, it sounds crazy amazing. So I'm definitely going to pick it up and check it out in the future. Yeah, totally. I think this one, um, what I would say is like there, there's a a great imagination in the book. Um, you know, um, he has an incredible imagination and can sort of paint pictures and scenery uh, very vividly that is um, extraordinary, like um, certain things in the book that just concepts that you would have never thought of, or at least I wouldn't. Um, one story in particular that is probably my favorite in the book is uh, In the City, In the Hills. Um, and that is about this, uh, these two gentlemen who are a couple. Um, they are kind of driving through this uh, forest area and they come across this massive giant that is built out of humans um, well actually you don't even really know it's a giant initially but it's just like if I just want to say this part to sort so people could sort of picture it but it's like all these humans bonded together like the strongest men were the heels of this giant and like the children that had the best vision sat where the eyes were and it's just this massive construction of people all bound together. And, um, you know, in the story, you kind of find out there's these two towns that every decade or something, they put all their people and bond them together to have this fight of these two giants. Um, and it's just really like, I don't want to give away a lot of stuff from the book, so I'm not going to tell too much more on others, but... I figured that one would be a good one to say because I don't know. I just that idea just blows me away. The concept of it. What do you guys think? Oh. It's like a sick fucking Voltron or something, man. <laughs> yeah. Sick sick Voltron. <laughs> <laughs> I I never heard of anything done like that before, and that's crazy. But like they have unique ideas that just haven't been done before, or you haven't read anywhere else. So I can see why something like that would inspire you or just encourage you to want to read it because. When we talked about it before, I was like, oh, man, that sounds fucking badass. i got to check it out. So I'm, I'm down with it. And I yeah, Clive Barker is one of those. Go ahead, man. Uh, so I was saying Clive Barker is one of those, like, the OG, one of the OGs of Splatterpunk. And he really just didn't give a fuck. He wrote whatever he wanted to no, no extent. Now, he left nothing out. He just kind of went for it and said, hey, I have this crazy-ass idea. And... I'm going to put it on paper, and if you don't like it, then fuck off. So I really, I, I do enjoy some of his really books. But I grew up watching a lot of the movies, and I didn't even realize they were Clive. Like, I didn't realize uh, Rawhead Rex was Clive Barker. Yeah. And you actually reminded, when we were talking about it before, you actually reminded me of that, Aaron, that it was in, it's in that book, isn't it, Rawhead Rex? It is, yeah. Um, also, Midnight Meat Train, which ended up uh, becoming yeah. a movie. Um yeah, I mean, like this... I, I love Nightbreed, man. Nightbreed was one of my favorite movies for a long time. Yes. And 
of course, Hellraiser, you know, all the, but, um, I feel like you mentioned something before. What other stories were in that book? Cause I feel like there was another one that was a movie that I didn't realize was his. Was it, was it Midnight Me Train? It might've been Midnight Me Train. Yeah. That was with like Vinnie Jones and like, again, like honestly, um, I'm, I'm super into, uh, like very human horror. Um, so things that have a high likelihood of happening that could actually, you know, touch you in a, in a scenario. And, but this book, the imagination in it, um, like, I don't know, I didn't get too deterred. Sometimes I can get deterred from a, a story if it's too fantastical because I like my horror, like kind of set down and, and grimy and, yeah, but I, I, I didn't feel that with this. And really, there's only one story in it, I think, called Dread, that is really more of a carnal nature without any any kind of, uh, you know, demons or, or ghosts or anything. And the concept of Dread is like this, this um, professor kind of learns these people's utmost fears. Uh, and tries to like study them and so like he finds out this girl that's a vegetarian and sort of like likes to debate him and you know he locks her in this in this abandoned building with this piece of meat and that's the only food source that she has and he's like you know an event and she doesn't want to do it and then it gets progressively more rotten and like maggot filled and you know it just gets grosser the longer she holds out um and I, that one, that's probably the only one that's not really like, you know, involving like demons or spiritual. But there was another one, the, the pornographer Shroud, where this dude dies and he wants like vengeance so bad that like his soul wills itself out of the body and into the sheet. And he like becomes the sheet that was over his body <laughs> and like cool. and it's animated and stuff. Very cool. Very imaginative, you know? Yeah. Hey, when you were talking about, um, I'm sorry, the oh, story where they were all meshed together, like how were they meshed together? Was it anything like, uh, what was it, uh, the human centipede? No, <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't quite ass to mouth, but uh, <laughs> keep the fans only talk to a minimum. No, just, <laughs> no. But uh, I think it was more just like like bondage, like they were like tied together. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So like they would slowly, like they'd all like lay down and they craft it and tie each person in place. And then like the the feet of the, it's so heavy. There's so many people. Like the feet of the giant are just these crushed men, like all gory and shit, Hell and taking yeah. steps. And it's just fucking awesome. I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I was else excited to... to watch that Hulu movie that came out. But I remember everybody was saying that it wasn't really like the books and that they took way too many liberties and stuff like that and so i watched it thinking that i was going to actually see some of the stories from the book and i don't think any of them were really in the books right uh, yeah yeah I, I didn't really care for it that much i mean it was okay like it's a, something that was like entertaining it like but... a creep show or something you know like a, just an anthology show but yeah. it just sucks because clive barker's a great director you know like you saw what he did in like the early hellraiser movies and um you know, I don't understand why they just don't, I, unless he just doesn't want to do it, you know, that could be one thing, but it just seems like he's, he's everything to me, you know, like he's, he's a painter. I have one of his pieces of artwork hanging in my office uh, as inspiration, like one of his real ones that my wife got for me. Uh, he's, he's done comics. He made an incredible video game called Jericho. He made an even older one on like fucking PC or something too. Um, he's obviously young adult books adult horror short stories comic books um like pretty much anything you can think of any medium for art you can think of he's tapped into it and i just admire that so much and um that's why he's my favorite uh artist in general um he's just dope I don't know. And when you hear him talk, and, and that's that's part of the inspiration. When I made the, the introduction music for the show, um, that's why I picked him. You know, like you said, Daniel, one of the founding fathers of Splatterpunk. And it, there was just a great old interview with him sort of defending himself from all these people that were trying to talk shit about, you know, oh, you know, what if somebody commits a violent crime based off what you wrote? 
And he's like, well, most of my shit is like fucking demons raising from the dead, you know, and like, it's not stuff that can happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but he just says it so eloquently, like, it, like the people asking the questions are very like, uh, just abrasive and like almost Neanderthal in, in their approach. Coming and, at him. And he just fucking explains it and like dumbs it down. And it's just incredible. We'll have to put the we'll have to put his uh, interview up on our YouTube so people can check it out. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, the one thing I will say about him is the fact that when you talk about his stories and you think when you hear the ideas of them, you're like, it doesn't sound like it's going to be scary or it's going to be serious. They some of them sound very hokey, but when you actually read them and you realize that he has that that skill to make something that sounds ridiculous into something that's truly terrifying is just an absolute you know like a gift that he has so that's why he's definitely a a pioneer and one of the best around yeah yeah his like uh his writing style is incredible uh and that was one of the things he said in his interview he said you know um i write you know with a with a complicated not not so complicated that people will get lost like the average reader but complex enough to where like somebody who shouldn't be reading it is probably not going to quite, you know, be able to use it as fuel to go kill somebody or something, you know? Yeah. But yeah, but yeah dude. So books of blood, Clive Barker. Uh, it's a no brainer. If you haven't read it, uh, please do, because I think you're just doing yourself a disservice. The artwork on this, three volume set is incredible too uh it has uh you know creepy ass demons it's like stone artwork almost and, how many uh, volumes what are there nine volumes uh there's, th like, there's three but, okay but he has he has other books that are short story collections like i think uh in the flesh is one um yeah and uh, i don't know in the inhuman condition is another so the and I think like you were talking about Daniel Candyman is in one of those. Yeah, I think uh, in, in Cabal, I think in Cabal they have a couple other ones in there. That's the one I forgot he wrote was Candyman. That's it. Yeah, right. that was that wasn't called Candyman. It was called Forbid the Forbidden. Yeah, I think that might be in the Flesh. I think that's in that one. I'm not sure. Honestly, all of them are dope though. All of his short story books are awesome. Um, he was, I think that might've been why, like I started writing short stories to start with, you know, I mean, not only is it a good place to start cause you could, you could tie it up quicker and kind of have a good feeling of a finished product much sooner. Um, but they're just fun. And there's, there's a certain art to writing short stories. Um, and he, if you're aspiring to write short stories, uh, this, this would behoove you really, uh, to read this book. Because it's one of the betters, the better books, better collections of all time, I would say. Um, and wrapping up on Clive Barker, though, I do want to mention um, my close second with the yellowed side uh, from my bookshelf is uh, Brett Easton Ellis, American Psycho. Um, yeah, this is the actual one that I believe I read in high school. I take really good care of my books, but the, the shit is yellowing like you're never going to stop that. Um but that one, it's in general fiction, but uh, I mean, this is as extreme as any extreme horror book. While it, there are some lulls with sort of descriptions of the time that may turn off some readers, um, to me, I loved it. Like it was just really going into the excess age of the 80s and sort of like painting that picture. Um, and we talked about, I think, Together, the four of us talked about it a little bit, but um, the, the the violence is incredible in this book. Um, oh, yeah. And, and nothing like the movie. You know, like, the movie has, you know, it has imprints of it, but this they couldn't make this into a major motion picture. Um, okay. The yeah. actual book, but... Yeah. Yeah, that one's definitely a, a powerful book in general, and just the fact, like you said, it... it it really is so satirical when it shows the the excess of that that era and that generation and how this psychopath just is a chameleon and just blends in with everyone and is like a, a faceless person almost and like you said the violence in that is 
just as graphic, if not more than anything coming out today. So it's uh, he did an excellent job on that book. And now, do you think Christian Bale did a good job with the character? Yeah, I mean, it, I, do. I thought he was incredible, and that it, it, it's the role that defined him. Well, I don't want to say that defines him, but it's the role that made him. He was a thing after yeah. that movie. Um, yes. Yeah. And um, actually, you know what's interesting too is um, speaking of Ellis, um, his other book, The Rules of Attraction. Um, I never knew it because uh, you know until I read both of them, but. It's pretty cool. Like, if you like Patrick Bateman, that character, um, in the Rules of Attraction, it's actually his brother, Sean Bateman. And, like, um, in, in American Psycho, they have dinner at one point. And uh, it's just real interesting. Like, he has some really cool uh, views and, like, ideas about, you know, the sort of snooty upscale of society and um, the excess that they partake in. It's just, his stuff's really cool. I gotta say, and it was some of the, some of the earlier influences for me, but I know Roland, you said you didn't, you said, you told us that you didn't even see the movie American Psycho. You just had to bring it up. That's a goddamn (laughs) sin. You had a week to do it. Not saying nothing. (laughs) By now you should have seen it. Yeah. I know, right? Yeah. Because I don't know. Um, Horror, well, you, it is horror because you say you like your horror more human. Um, so I guess maybe that's why I haven't watched it. Because I mean, for me, when I read horror or watch horror, it tends to be on the uh, monster side or supernatural or something just weird and freaky. So maybe that's why I haven't strayed to that, that side or I've seen that movie as of yet or read the book either. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense, yeah. But I would say I, th- I think you would like it. So, I mean, if you like, like, even, like, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's, oh, yeah. that's, I consider that human horror. Definitely. You know, yeah. um, even though it feels like monster horror, too, though, right? So, yeah, it does. Yeah. Th- there's a cool, like, overlap with some, with certain things, you know? Um, and I think, uh, I think that this one, though, if, if you haven't read it, you know, I, I had to bring it up just because it, I read it in high school before Books of Blood, and it just had a... An incredible impact on me. Awesome. Yeah, this probably seemed like a dumb question, but would you say it's a complicated read? I'm I'm asking because in the uh, I think it's the Books of Horror group on Facebook, I've seen that book come up at least a couple of times where people were debating on. It was one of those that came up. You know, I just tried to read this and I just couldn't get into it. I can't find the appeal, um, and I feel like it might have been because it was a, kind of a complicated read. I don't know because I haven't read it. So. Um, but would you say, is that the reason why? Like, I don't know. Well, I would say, um, le- there, like I was trying to say earlier, I don't know if I want to say complicated. There, There's things in it that leave it up to the reader to decide, right? So there's like a debate that should go on once you finish the book. Just like with the movie, you know? Some people are yeah. conf- confused by how it ends, you know? And they're still like kind of going back and forth about it. And I remember like, sitting in the library i had this teacher mr thompson he was a really fucking cool guy um and he's the one that read this he was reading this and i I ended up reading it and we would kind of debate like what we thought about it you know what i mean um but i don't think it's complex and daniel you i mean you can weigh in too i don't think it's complex but i think that there's like a lot of like heavy description of the times and maybe that is what turned people off. But yeah, this this book it's not a it's not like a James Patterson where you could freaking you know skip six pages and still know what's going on. You you kind of have to pay attention to an extent. Um, it's not. There are some sections where it does drone. Like Aaron, you have it in front of you. How many pages is it? It's got to be all four hundred something pages probably. Mm, I think and it's, like, it's decent. Oh yeah, you're right. It is almost four. So and and you could see it's not like a trade paperback size, four hundred pages. It's probably a six by nine or something like that. So it's a long book, um, and there is definitely some sections that you're you kind of drone out a little bit, but you have to pay attention to it because, like Aaron said, there's certain subtle nuances in there that I might interpret differently than someone else. And you know, I don't think anybody really knows how it ends. You know, what what the ending is 
is one of those great debates that people will see the movie and read the book and you're like, you know, there nobody's wrong, I don't think, but it's it's one of those things where it's it's debatable. Um, what what if everyone's wrong, dude? We're all wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing about this book though, right? When it, Brett Easton Ellis wrote American Psycho, he was on a coke binge in his hotel room for like days. He would fucking do coke to the point of just complete blackout and like be all fucked up and he'd wake up and like three chapters would be written. You know what I mean? He had no I was like clue what he wrote. Isn't that what Stephen King said about writing Cujo? Like Cujo. <laughs> yeah. It was Cujo, right? That he said he didn't even remember writing. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of them. I think, there's, I think there was a couple. So is that what I have to do? Yeah. <laughs> Step one exactly. by Tonico. Is that what we got to do to write a bestseller? Just get coked yeah. out and not even know we're writing a book? Like, this, this show is going to be like the best writing advice ever. Like, yeah. Be... Right? Oh, the... man. For all the writers that need advice, just get like a couple eight balls, you know, some it meth. Lit. Yeah, just yeah. fucking. Let me get my dealer on the line now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just playing. I don't have a dealer. <laughs> nah. Right, half more. dead, and it's sober. Isn't that the same? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. But, all right. So I think that that about wraps it up for my uh, writing inspiration. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Next week, we will have uh, one of the other members give their book choice for sort of a book that inspired them. But for this week, to finish up the podcast, we're going to get into the second half of the show. And that's our interview with Daniel J. Volpe. Daniel, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> it's so funny because usually when you bring like somebody in, they haven't been talking the whole time. So this yeah. is cool. It's, it's a weird, yeah. it's a weird introduction, but uh, very. All right. Well, why don't you tell us? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the beginning? Like, where did it? Where did it begin? W with horror writing for you. Um, I, I've always kind of been a horror fan. Um, I think in my my bio, in in my books, and online, uh, when I was about four years old, my grandfather accidentally rented me Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, for like I said, for some of the uh, younger listeners, there used to be video stores with actual cassettes, yeah. and you could go there and rent the cassette. And um, he didn't have his glasses with him that day, and I just saw this box and I picked it up and he rented it for me and uh, went back home and pretty much he stuck me in a room and with the TV and the VCR and I was scared shitless. And like I said, I think I was six until I was sixteen. I thought Freddy Krueger lived under the bed or behind the door, so. That, that feeling of fear, um, even though I was terrified, it kind of had that little bit of a, an adrenaline dump. So I always loved horror. And once I started learning to read, you know, like most of us, I kind of start off with kids' books, you know, um, Goosebumps, you know, all the Arl Stein, uh, who's the other one? Fear Street. I think Fear Street was another one, right? That was a little more yeah. older. And then from there, I kind of got into to reading Stephen King. And it just took off from there. Um, I've always kind of been a natural storyteller. So I, it, it was just a natural progression for me to start writing horror. I like scaring people. I've, I'm the oldest of four. So you can ask my siblings. I like to scare the shit out of them. Uh, I scare my kids whenever I can just to kind of keep them on their toes. So I, I always, I'm always a fan of anything that's scary. So I just kind of started writing horror stories. And I think I told you guys earlier that uh, one of my earliest ones, which I still have in loose leaf, was called the Chickenator, and it was a seven foot chicken slash Terminator that would kill people with popcorn chicken shot out of his machine gun. And my uh, my hero of the story killed him with a bottle of barbecue sauce to the face. Uh, so that was um, that was that. And then from then on, I just I just kept writing, and I just pretty much stuck with horror up, up until now. Any plans for a Chickenator sequel? Uh, um, I, I thought about it. It's called The Colonel Strikes Back, but um, I'm not sure yet, but we'll see. We need a Chickenator versus Kong versus Godzilla. Okay. Yeah. Versus yeah. Human Centipede. Yeah. For Roland. <laughs> For Roland, you said. <laughs> oh, man. So can you tell us um, maybe about uh, your first, uh, like when you first got some stuff published maybe, or like how that... How that process worked? Did you just start um, 
doing submissions or were you were you writing something prior to any submissions? What was that like? Yeah, so I, I pretty much start off like we talked about earlier with um, short stories, just kind of probably like most horror writers. And I, I kind of like the short story because I'm, I'm impatient. You know, I like to have that ending. I like to get it done. And I wrote, you know, a ton of short stories here and there. And then at one point I saw an ad on Facebook in or on Craigslist, not not like the the bad side of Craigslist, but like the good side of Craigslist. And um, so it was for a, a newer literary e-zine that was um, called Exiles Literary. And that's run by what well, was run by Wilbur Stanton. And I submitted a story to them to him actually and he picked it up and published it for me and it was uh had a little bit of an interesting reception some people didn't like didn't like it they thought it was a little too over the top but he was cool about it he told them pretty much to eat shit and he published it and kept it kept it up even though they didn't you know some of the readers didn't care for it he liked it and it was his publication so uh, that was kind of one of the first times as an adult that I had something that was somebody else put their name on and picked up for me. What made you go to Craigslist of all places for short story <laughs> submissions? Like, like it just, Honestly, it just does not seem like, like when I weird, think right? writing or like submitting stories, <laughs> you know, I, I think I associate nefarious activities with Craigslist sometimes. Yeah. I went there to try and, and do advertisements for books for marketing and it didn't work. So, <laughs> oh, you are on the right page, obviously. Um, <laughs> honestly, I really didn't. This was probably in 2009, I'd say, roughly around then, maybe maybe even earlier than that. And I really had no idea where to go. You know, obviously Facebook was around, but it wasn't what it is now. The you know submission process for any of these other like larger actual magazines like Fangoria or Room Org, you know, that was. To me, that was an impossible goal, so I really didn't know where to look, and kind of just through Google searches and on gigs on Craigslist, they had. I clicked on writing, and I I found some. Um, some of them were mostly they were like technical writing and stuff like that, but every now and then I'd find something like the magazine that I did find. So, and there was no nefarious activities then, at that point. Uh, hey, what was the name of that first story you're talking about? That story was actually called uh, Found, and it was a little girl who was um, – actually, no, I'm sorry. That one's called Lost. I have another one that's called Found. She was lost on the boardwalk, and she ends up getting eaten by a monster, uh, for lack of a better term. And some of the descriptions I had in there, I think people were kind of put off by. But, um, yeah. People hate it when you kill kids, man. Ones. You know? They don't like it. They don't like it. It's no, just so no. fun, though. Kids and yeah, animals. they're easy. Yeah. Oh, they forget. Yeah, about them. yeah, animals too. Also, honestly, yeah. you know. Wrote, go ahead, wrote Carter. Billy Silver, and Billy Silver was a badass book. I really enjoyed that Thank one a lot. You. I didn't realize. I don't know how I didn't like note it. I didn't get it, but I saw your new book. Is it Talia? What's the name of the new one? Yeah, Talia. Talia, and I didn't somehow I didn't get that that was Talia from. Like, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about all this because it's not really a spoiler, right? To say no, that she's no. a character in Billy Silver. But, and Correct. I didn't like, somehow I saw the cover, I saw the name, and, and it took you actually mentioning or saying it for me to say, oh, that's who that is. Like, okay, I get it now. But, because she's an intriguing character, man. I'm, I'm kind of curious yeah. what you're, where, where you're going with that, what you're doing with that one. So I'm excited about that one. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm really excited about that one. That should be uh, May first. That's going to come out in hopefully paperback, Kindle, and possibly hardcover. Um, it's that's a semi prequel kind of. I won't I won't really call it a prequel because they're both standalones. Billy Silver kind of is a present day story, whereas Talia is just her story, and that one is set in the early '90s. So you could read them independently and not be confused at all. But um, it's going to be her origin story, how she started off, you know, and how she became what she is in Billy Silver. So I'm, I'm really excited for that one. The artist who um, – I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, man. I was going to say the artist who created the uh, Talia um, cover, they did a great job with capturing the essence because 
I look at that cover and I think about Billy Silver and I'm like, damn, I could see her from your descriptions in Billy Silver because they were so vivid that I, when I saw the cover for Talia, I was like, oh, damn, I could see her. I saw her. Yeah, yeah that both of those covers, the newer Billy Silver cover with the, the broken glass and the cover for Talia were were done by one guy, and I almost don't want to give away his name because I don't want everybody flocking to him, but I will just because he's he's a very talented guy, and he's a great guy to work with. Uh, his name is uh, his name is actually Michael Squid, and he's actually a, a very good author himself, but I messaged him a couple years ago just BSing because he, he had a podcast, and he's a talented artist, and just recently we kind of uh, got back in touch because he was releasing a short story collection, and I just kind of messaged him and said, hey, do you think you could do this? And within like a couple of hours, we had the Talia cover done. Um, right. And it, it wasn't, he'd take an idea and get back to me in a week. It was literally like we were messaging each other back and forth and he would send me a picture. He's like, what do you think of this? And I would tell him, change this, 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 and this. And he'd be like, okay, give me give me an hour. And it with, within you know one day, I had a full cover. And Billy Silver, I could show you guys the original uh, first draft of that cover to where it is now and it's just light years different and he just does he just does great work he's a great artist and he's super receptive so and this is something that and this is a great example of stuff that we're going to get into more after the four episode launch where you're getting to know all of us right because daniel had a great story one that the three of us have all read um and that many other people have read it's it's a highly reviewed book um, I think it's four and a half stars, right? Over 50 reviews on Amazon. People are liking it, you know? People are enjoying it. Um, but could it have, could more people have been enjoying it if it had been, the cover had been addressed initially? You know, and this is certain things, like I had things with my covers too, and my editing that, you know, these are things we're gonna get into on the show to show you like where we had a hiccup in the road. Maybe if you're just getting started out, you can you can make that transition nice and easy, learn from our mistakes. We don't know it all, but we're gonna give you everything we got, you know? But I think that's a, that's a great example of what we're gonna be talking about on the show. Yeah. I'm just curious if, if you can, can you tell us what Awakened in Blood is about real quick? Just, I know that's your last book, right? Yeah, yep. That's so Awakened in Blood came out yeah, that came out in the beginning of March. I think it was on March 6th. Um, that's kind of my homage to the 80s because, like, I'm sure, like, most of us, like, I love 80s horror. I yeah. love the – just, like, even, like, American Psycho. Like, the over-the-topness of the 80s horror is just – it's great. So I yeah. kind of wanted to do something like that, and I have an idea for another slasher, so I'm not going to call this a slasher. This is kind of more of a haunted house possession type of book. Um, it's set up in a fictional town in New York. And there's a old lodge that in the beginning of the book, you read about it and it has some rather peculiar beginnings. And these uh, four couples head up there for a couple's retreat. That is a therapy session. Pretty much it's run. The lodge is owned by uh, an older couple that are counselors and the other couples go there to, to kind of work on themselves and their relationships. And they realize soon that there's something not right about the people there and not right about the lodge and the woods around it and hilarity ensues but there's this book is very over the top with sex and violence it's the first half is pretty much a porno um <laughs> but it's uh it, but it's it's like i said it's my kind of throwback to the 80s and yeah. you've seen some of these things like chopping mall like i love chopping mall i have a poster of the uh the movie poster hanging up my wall down in my office and same thing. Like it's ridiculous. Like it's just, you know, they're just, they're having sex in a furniture store, and for no reason. Like it's just, you know, out of nowhere. Um, so I kind of want to do something like that, and uh, so yeah, that's that's my newest one. It's out. I love the setup, Daniel, uh, with um, you know, the couples retreat, sort of trying to get right. It's a great setup. I don't think it's overused either. Like. I'm hard pressed to think of that being used in something else. And whenever that crosses my mind, I'm always like, oh, that's cool. You know, something that's not fucking beaten to death. You know what I mean? Um, that can be important. And I, you told me, I believe that um, you had considered 
making it like a swingers thing too, right? And then you made the decision yeah. to make it like a couple's mm -hmm. retreat. Can you talk about that? I think that's, that's interesting just to see what your decision process on that is. Yeah, so originally I kind of wanted to have it as as a as a swingers club, like this like weird like sexual retreat kind of thing where all these people gather together, and then I was going to have it more of a slasher serial killer kind of thing, you know, thunderstorms, the lights go out, and I just couldn't really make it work. Like I I like the character driven stories. Obviously, I think that we all know that characters make the story, and if these people were all there and they weren't a if there was no emotional connection to each other. I didn't think it would work out or it would have the, the gravity of having married couples. So in the end, I kind of decided to go against the grain with that and changed it up and I made it couples. And I think that you see the relationships with these couples and they, you know, it, it just adds to that depth of emotion in the story. Oh, totally. like, like, like who gives a shit, right? If it's just a bunch of people fucking each other in the woods, like, yeah, yeah kill them all. But if you can, and, and we'll talk about this too. It's like, if you can make somebody care about the character or if like this one couple's going through some shit that you could relate to or something, you know what I mean? Like then the reader's like, oh yeah, okay, this, th I, I'm fucking relating to this. Like I'm into this, you know? Whereas if it's just a swingers thing, it just, like you said, it takes away a lot of the emotional aspect um, that, you know, can can uh, feed into the readers, I feel like. Absolutely. And the, the four couples, uh, their, their problems, because they're there obviously for, for self-help, you have a uh, couple that has, has an adultery in, in, their, in their marriage. Another couple is having trouble conceiving. Another couple is having... Uh, they're getting ready to retire. At least one half is ready to retire. The other half still wants to work. And then the final one is your kind of that uh, quintessential cliche high school relationship where the girl got you know pregnant at a young age and it was like a shotgun wedding and they're still together you know in their late thirties now and he's an asshole and she's kind of you know a little bit loose with herself and these are realistic relationship issues that people I think can relate to and like you said Aaron I think it kind of brings that that um familiarity unfortunately to some people <laughs> <laughs> you're like these fucking losers that read my books no. yeah <laughs> yeah and it's just it's that little bit of char that character development that means so much and that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking about in later episodes and stuff but mm. yeah I mean that right there man that's awesome yeah, and I think you just open a can of worms, Daniel, for future stuff, right? Like, that's something that the other three of us can think about, too, I think. You know, like, was there anything in our stories that we had planning on going the other way um, and that we, that we switched? But I think more importantly, too, we'll be, you know, obviously talking to other people in the community, uh, other authors, and getting their insights, too. It's exciting stuff but what's i mean i think roland you you we had talked before the show and you were saying uh you wanted to ask daniel what was in the future right like what what yeah, comes next right like what's next in your plate? all right so um i have talia coming out may 1st uh that's uh, that's a self-published that's all me and uh my editor right now who's diligently working i hope because uh he's supposed to have me by the 15th so Lee, if you listen to this, get your ass in gear. I want that by the 15th. Or you ain't, or you ain't getting paid. You put them on blast. Um, yeah, I don't play around. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, a couple months ago, I, re I signed with D&T Publication or Publishing, um, run by Dawn Shea, which everybody everybody listening to this should know who she is. Uh, she's awesome. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. So she's so nice. a very hard worker. She's yeah. actually was just literally just messaging me on my phone as we were doing this. Um, so she is, she's nose to the grindstone. Um, I have two books coming out through DNT. One will be in July. That is a gift of death. That's kind of my vampire story. And, uh, Aaron, you'll like it cause they're all like grungy metal vampires. So I think you'll kind yeah, of, uh, dude, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> throwing off the horns, getting in the pit. Um, so that's my my vampire story, and then also through DNT in I think November I have my longest work to date called Left to You that is um, about seventy something thousand words, and that is going to be that's going to be more of the most traditional horror that I've done. 
Um, there's really not much sex in that. Actually, there's no sex in that, shockingly. Um, there's some violence, but that one is more of an emotional kind of book. Um, it takes place in two different time periods. One is present day, and one is actually during the Holocaust. So there is definitely some really deep emotional things in that book. And um, I can't wait for that one to come out. And I have two short stories that are coming out in separate anthologies. One is called Cut Around the Ass, which is a, uh, a short I story. Love that would be, I love that title. <laughs> I, I think that's the only reason I got in the anthologies because that's a great title. <laughs> But that is coming out in the Gorefest anthology by Evil Cookie, uh, Evil Cookie Publishing there by K Trap Jones. So that I don't know when exactly that'll be coming out, but it will be sometime this year. And then another anthology that Aaron and I and some other select authors will be in uh, from Potter's Grove. I don't think we don't have a title on that one yet, right? I don't think he gave us a title. No, not yet. Yeah, but it's gonna it's gonna include like a lot of a lot of pretty cool people that. Um do very extreme stuff so i i expect it to be a pretty wild book you know oh yeah based on i have a, a story a story in that one that's about nine thousand words that's called um just a friend so whenever that gets um finished up i think river dixon from potter's grove is just waiting on a few more stories to come in and then we we're gonna go forward with that when you submitted just a friend did river did he say you you got yeah. what I need. He did. <laughs> I couldn't imagine River Dixon singing anything, let alone that song. But uh... we started off. I was gonna say we started off as a podcast. Next thing you know, we're gonna be a boy group. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. gotta get it while it's hot. You know what I'm saying? Um, I got a quick question for you, Daniel. So all of these stories and all of these things that you're working on, are they already 100% complete or are you still working on stuff? No, they're all, they're all done. Um, so uh, when I self-publish something, I obviously I write it and then I go through and I edit it, but I'm shitty with grammar. So I pay somebody who's smarter than I am and then he goes through it and he edits it. So everything that's written is, is done. Um, okay. Talia is just being edited now. Um, the D and T stuff, Dawn, she'll take care of all the editing on that. So that everything is completely done. Endings are done. So and the reason I was asking, cause I was wondering if you actually, I don't know if you guys, anybody, um, like, do you find yourself working on multiple stories at one time or do you normally finish a story before you move on to your next book? And you guys can all answer that. So I, I have been blessed with the fact that I can write quickly. When I get a story idea, especially for a, for a, a novel or a novella, I will bang it out within a couple weeks, if not months. Um, Talia is just under 40,000 words. I wrote it in like two and a half weeks. Um, so when, when I get going, I just get going. Um, in 2020, unfortunately, it was really bad for some people. It was very good for me in the terms of writing. I cranked out about 200,000 words um, from – March 2020 to about February 2021, and that included five novels and novellas and probably about ten short stories. Mm. So once I kind of get the bug, I just I just go with it. That's cool. Yeah, I think I think I'm kind of similar to you, Daniel, in that regard. Where, um, but I will work multiple projects. But recently, I was like, yo, I need to fucking clean out the queue. Um, because I had about three or, f or four ideas that were sitting there and it's like, man, I got, and this is something we'll talk about on the podcast. It's like, okay, you don't want to force anything, right? If, if it's, you're not going to write it just to write it. But I started forcing myself to think about the ideas more and getting ready. And then the writing comes naturally, right? Um, but if you got four or five books sitting there and you got four books out, right? Like, I think for me, I had like eight books out, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. yo, I have these other four things sitting there. I'm like, I need to get these done so I can get them out and start making revenue off of them. I'm already investing a ton of time in them and money into the illustrations and the artwork and whatnot. Um, so, but I will not force it. So if it's not ready to go, if the, if the idea is not good enough, then I won't do it. But I just, I tried to focus like Wedding Day Massacre was something I had been working on kind of, I think for close to a year, actually with that one. Um, 
But that's novel length too. That was my first novel length piece. A lot of stuff was shorter. But yeah, that's so my thing is like I'll I'll do many things at once. Um, but I like to try and finish stuff up too if I can. Yeah. What about you, Carver? Yeah, I'm kind of I don't like to stop inspiration when it hits. So and news you you, you know you guys know how it is. So many stories just hit you like all the time, man. So like I will stop whatever I'm doing and focus on a story, at least in the beginning, just to kind of get the words out, get mm -hmm. and then I'll type some notes and stuff on it. But then I try to get back to whatever story is, is most important to me at that time. Right now, I'm in a process where um, I'm juggling multiple stories, and I'm still waiting for that one that's going to really grip me. There's one that I am working on that I know I need to finish. Um, but like you said, I'm trying not to force it, so I am allowing myself to kind of work on multiple projects at once. And then I also have other pen names. So to me, that's the hardest part is I get pulled away because I know – as much as I love horror and I just want to focus all my time on horror, I have built up other pen names uh, in the erotica and romance side and stuff like that. And it sucks sometimes because I'm like, man, I really need to put a book out for that name too. Yeah. So I got to go do that and then come back to horror. And so that's where some of my issues come up. It's just trying to balance and go back. That's very insightful though. And that's something that we'll dive deeper in onto on later episodes is um because you're I think I believe right now you're the only one with multiple pen names. Am I correct when I say that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So we'll probably have to have a specific topic about that and do a deep dive on that because that's an interesting just the few things that you're saying right there, I have like twenty questions on it. But this is <laughs> this is Daniel's yeah. time. Um All right. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> no, this is great. I love it. But uh, so I guess you've you did you tell us everything right at this point? I feel like you went through your whole list of stuff that's coming out. But there is one anthology that you're going to be in that you forgot to mention. Oh, no, <laughs> there is. <laughs> what is that? Oh, no, wait. <laughs> no. So uh, we've been talking and we think it's only appropriate to do uh, a written in red anthology with the four of us uh you know uh to commit to commemorate this unbelievable podcast experience that we're about to unleash this platform that we're about to uh provide to uh the horror community and hopefully it will be a good platform we'll see i think it will be but um a short story from each of us in a single volume uh we will do something together um i had talked about working with all you guys anyway like individually so it only makes sense that we brand it and written in reds cool shit. Why else would we have picked it for the name? Exactly. And then in the future, cool. as we get uh, different people on the podcast, maybe somebody that hasn't had an opportunity to be in a, an anthology or, uh, you know, and we see that they're doing awesome shit, we can extend them an invite, you know, maybe we can make it depending on how long this goes. Maybe we can make it like an annual thing. You know, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Cool. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, I think that about wraps us up for the first launch episode of the Written and Red podcast. Uh, that is the horror reader and writers podcast. Remember, if you have questions, we're going to be taking questions from folks at uh, Written and Red podcast at gmail .com. You can email us there. We've already received a few. Um, but we want to have these topics ready so that when we start doing after these first initial four episodes, we can really start diving into what you guys want to hear discussed from the realm of writing. And this could be question. If you have a question for Carver Pike specifically or about different aspects of our careers, or if it's just writing in general and you want to hear the take from all of us, nothing is off limits. Fans, fans only, right? What is that? What we say? Only fans. Yeah. Only fans. <laughs> only fans. <laughs> but uh, but I guess that's it. That's the first episode, guys. Let's wrap up. Uh, we save our own plugs for the end. So, uh, Roland, why don't you tell them where they can find your stuff or what what you suggest if people want to check you out? Uh, definitely. You can um, either find me on Amazon. Or um, at RolandVersiJr.com. Uh, that's where my stuff is. Daniel, 
Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm pretty active on there. Uh, Daniel Volpe is just my regular page. I have an author page as well, which is Daniel J. Volpe. Uh, Amazon, just plug in my name and it'll pop up. Uh, right now, I don't know when this will air, but as of right now, Awakened in Blood is only available in ebook on godless.com. So if you want to check it out in ebook, it is on there. Uh, Instagram, uh, DJ Volpe author, uh, if you want to check that out. And if you Google Daniel J. Volpe Horror, that will pop up with my Wix site. And I try to update that, but I've kind of fallen behind. But Awaken in Blood is available in paperback, right? And hardcover, is it? Yes, yes. It's a way, it's available in paperback, hardcover through Amazon, and ebook through Godless only for right now. Okay. And Carver, what about yourself? You can find me on carverpike.com or carverpike pretty much on all the social media sites. I'm starting to roll my stuff out wide. Um, so you'll start seeing my book show up on godless.com. Scalp is already there right now. Grad Knight will be up there soon. And uh, Barnes and & Noble and all the other wide sites. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Paperbacks are all on Amazon. And I'm Aaron Beauregard. And you can find my stuff at uh, Amazon just by typing my name. Or you can go to www.evilexamine.com. That is my other podcast that deals with like weird shit, true crime, paranormal. Um, if you like that stuff, give it a listen. Also, um, I have some items on Godless too. So I also recommend checking out Godless. And um, I'm very active on social media as far as um, if you need any kind of like signed copies, just go ahead. Feel free to direct message me, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I don't give a fuck. I'm on all of them. I'll do it. Um, fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> do it live. <laughs> I just want to say um, Evil Examined is a great show, and JP is the best one out of the Holy Trinity, Unholy Trinity. Oh, Shouts out, yo. JP. <laughs> Shots that's, fired. That's, uh, that's fair, you know? I would say it's fair. <laughs> but uh, we thank you guys for joining us on this uh, launch episode of the Written and Red podcast. And again, just remember to subscribe on YouTube iTunes and Spotify and soon very soon we will be on the other platforms like Google Play and all that other other fun stuff but until next time keep it 100% horror <laughs> <laughs>